In the tradition of the rabbis at the time of Jesus, uh, when they taught, they sat to teach. That's not why I'm doing it, but um, it's a nice thought. The Apostle Paul said that he gave thanks to God for his weakness. Uh, we have from his testimony that he had a thorn in the flesh and we don't know what it was, but we know there was something that he was not healed from. And so he boasted in his weakness so that people would hear God's voice rather than look to him as a human being for their strength and their hope. And so today I boast in my weakness uh, the sickness that I've had for quite some time has also felt very much like a thorn in the flesh. But I'm just glad to be here with you this morning. The scripture passage uh, is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, and I am reading from the New Revised Standard Version translation of the Bible into English. Jesus is telling this story and he says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. This poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in agony in these flames. <clears throat> but Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, there is a great chasm, and it has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Today I'm going to tell you 
the secret to happiness. Secret to happiness. It is scientifically studied. The one thing that could change your life forever. But first, this message. And before I share this message, I want to ask if there's anyone here from Scotland. Anybody from Scotland? No? Okay, then my really bad Scottish accent is going to be all right this morning. I'm going to quote a poem from a couple centuries ago, more than 200 years ago. Oh, would some power the gift to gee us to see ourselves as others see us. It would for money a blunder free us and foolish notion. What airs in dress and gait would lee us and in devotion. Now, does anybody understand that at all? No. <laughs> it's English. It's just Scottish English. My grandmother used to love to quote the first line of this stanza, even though she also did not have a Scottish accent. I'm told she had Scottish blood, though, that her ancestors had come from Scotland to the United States even before the War of Revolution. So this is the line she used to repeat, and I'll try to say it in a way that sounds a little bit more like today's English. Oh, would some power the gifty give us to see ourselves as others see us. Now, here, here's a different translation from English to English. Oh, that God would give us the very smallest of gifts, gifty, smallest of gifts, to be able to see ourselves as others see us. It would save us from many mistakes and foolish thoughts. We would change the way we look and gesture and to how and to what we apply our time and attention. If only we could see ourselves the way others see us. Now, that's not as pretty, that translation. Doesn't sound as much like a poem. The words are from Scotland's most beloved poet, Robert Burns. And he lived more than 250 years ago. And the title of the poem, does anybody recognize it at all? Does it sound like anything you've heard? Okay, for those who might recognize it, the title of the poem is called To a Louse. It is a poem about insects. Does anybody know what a louse is? <laughs> it's a poem about head lice, about those insects that like to live in people's hair. And Robert Burns had a twisted sense of humor, which is probably part of the reason that people still love him today. Very sarcastic sense of humor. And here's one explanation of this poem. In this poem, the narrator is noticing an upper-class lady in church, a wealthy, important lady from the higher classes. And as he looks at her, he sees that there is this little insect roving around in her hat, her very expensive hat, her designer hat. And I'm really sorry to bring this up because when you start talking about this, everybody is going to start to... Can to my huh? We're going to start itching because we're talking about insects. Oh dear, too bad. <laughs> but the poet in this poem criticizes this little insect in his mind for not realizing how important that lady is. And then the more the poet thinks about it, he realizes that if that little insect thinks at all, it thinks one thing. I am the predator, you are the prey. 
and to a louse, we are all equal prey, just like to a mosquito. Mosquitoes live off of us, don't they? I don't think they respect us. They think of us as food, yes? Same thing with lice. And if we only realized that lice do not respect us or look up to us, perhaps we would not think of ourselves as quite so important. So, this very important lady in this poem did not realize what insects thought of her. And I would suggest that the rich man in Jesus' story had no idea how he was seen by others. Perhaps his friends thought that everything he did was just fine. But friends are often like that. Friends will support you in whatever you do, whatever way you live. But the way Jesus tells this story, he makes it clear that the rich man never thought there was a reason to take notice of the poor man at his gates. Jesus makes that very clear in his story. And yet, and yet, according to Jesus' parable, the way he tells the story, that is the one thing the rich man should have done. The one thing. The only thing. Jesus doesn't tell us of any other sin that the rich man might have committed at all. That's it. For that one mistake, the one mistake of not noticing the poor man at his gates, he goes to hell. Hades. He goes to hell. Now, I don't know about you, but in the culture of my country, the United States, we don't like to talk about hell. Uh, in the kinds of churches that I come from, people don't like to hear about hell, and they don't like to talk about it, and it makes people uncomfortable. But here it is in a story that Jesus told just for that one, what is called sin of omission, that, is, that means a sin, something you did not do, something you left undone, something that you failed to do. And that's part of a very traditional, very well-known prayer of confession in the English language. Forgive us, O God, for the things that we have done and the things that we have left undone. Just for that one thing he did not do, he goes to hell. Now here's another interesting thing in this story. The poor sick man, the poor beggar, who sits at the gates of the rich man's property, this poor man has a name. Did you know that this is the only time in any of the parables that Jesus told that a character in the story gets a name? It's the only time. The only time Jesus gives a name to somebody in one of his stories. And that should tell us what Jesus thinks of people who are poor and who suffer. The only character with a name. By contrast, the rich person has no name in this story. That doesn't fit with stories that we're used to hearing. Rich people get names in the stories that we hear. Poor people get stepped over or driven by or avoided. There are preachers who have preached entire sermons calling the rich man old what's-his-name. That's another English saying. It's just a way of not really respecting somebody. Old what's-his-name can't even remember his name. 
And then there's one preacher who preaches this story and calls the rich man nameless. And he does not even use a capital letter for his name, just a small letter, nameless. And this preacher says that Jesus goes to the trouble of telling us that nameless wore the finest of clothing. That's what purple means. Anything that was colored purple was unbelievably expensive in ancient days. And not only this, <laughs> according to this preacher, the rich man wore fancy foreign undergarments. Yes, fancy underwear. And why do we know that? Because that's what fine linen means in the Bible. Fine linen meant fancy imported Egyptian underwear. But he had no name. And the nameless man died and went to hell. And he called on Father Abraham to do something about it. And Father Abraham told Nameless that it was too late. Now, someone may argue with me and say, no, 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 the rich man did have a name. Has anyone heard of a name for the rich man in this story? Well, in tradition, Christian Western, Christian tradition, his name was Dives, D-I-V-E-S, or Dives, if you pronounce it the Latin way, and that just simply means rich man in Latin. So, it comes from one of the oldest Latin translations of the Bible, the Vulgate, which was translated about four centuries after the time of Jesus. So, since Jesus didn't give the rich man a name, people who read the story decided to give him one. Rich man. But it seems that they were making a mistake because when Jesus gave him no name, Jesus was speaking loud and clear. It seems that Jesus did that on purpose. So here's a question. How did Lazarus, the poor man, go to heaven? How did he go to the arms of Abraham? After all, what good things had he done? All we know is that he was poor, and he was sick, and he was forgotten. Jesus doesn't say that he did any good deeds. And by the way, the name Lazarus is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Eleazar, which means God is my help. So you see, Jesus gave him that name on purpose because nobody helped him except God. There were no human beings who helped this man at all. His only help was God. So I found myself thinking of another story in Scripture. Do you remember the story of the two thieves that were crucified on either side of Jesus? And one of those thieves was the one that Jesus told, I will see you today in paradise. You will be with me in paradise. What good thing did that thief do? to deserve heaven. What good thing did Lazarus do to deserve heaven? Does that mean that some people go to heaven without having done one righteous thing in their life, at least that we know of? Well, the thief on the cross did argue for Jesus against the other thief. He did ask Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. And maybe Lazarus was nice to the dogs. We don't know. But the story does seem to tell us that some people go to hell simply because there was a good thing they should have done, and they never did it. 
One preacher puts it this way, the only blessings waiting for nameless in the afterlife are the blessings which he shared in this life with others. None. Now, I'm reminded of, of one of those jokes about heaven that gets told in my culture. You know how the, the stories about heaven always say that you, you go to the door of heaven and St. Peter is the one that meets you? Has anyone heard a story like this? You, know, you go to heaven, St. Peter is the one who meets you because he has the keys to the kingdom, according to scripture. And so there was a very wealthy man who died and went to heaven, and St. Peter greeted him and took him on a tour. And uh, as they were walking, he saw a beautiful, beautiful mansion, a beautiful house, so elegant, so tasteful, so well-designed, so lovely. And the grounds around the house, the garden, was so beautiful and so done in such good taste with such beautiful colors and trees and shrubs and flowers. And this rich man said, oh my goodness, that is a wonderful home. Who does it belong to? And St. Peter said to him, well, that belongs to the man who worked in your garden for many years. You may not have paid attention to him, but that was your gardener, and that's his mansion here in heaven. Oh, my goodness, thought the rich man to himself. If that's his house, just think what a beautiful house I will have. And so he was really looking forward to, okay, where's my house? When am I going to see it? And as they walked farther and farther, they came to a little shack, a little lean-to. It almost didn't have a roof and only two walls, and it was made of rotten wood. And the rich man said, whose house is that? And St. Peter said, well, that's your house. And he said, how can that be? How, how can I have something so horrible? And St. Peter said, well, these were only the only materials that you sent ahead for us to build with. Remember what Jesus said about laying up treasures in heaven? So, <laughs> the same preacher who called the man nameless said, I wonder if Abraham was a little bit snippy when he answered the rich man in this story. What if he said something like, Oh, you want a drop of water? Okay, well, for every drop of water you gave to Lazarus, well, he can bring you one. Surely with the thousands of gallons of water you spilled and wasted in your life, you at least gave him a cup, a cup of water at some time? Oh, oh, sorry, I, I see. N not a drop? You never gave him a drop? Oh, well. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us that Father Abraham talked with that tone of voice when he told Nameless that the answer was still no. But blinding yourself to the needs of people who are right there in front of you is apparently a serious serious crime in God's universe. So, I, I mentioned the secret to happiness. <laughs> well, now I'm going to tell you. It's gratitude. No, not, not somebody else saying thank you to you for something you have done. It's you being thankful for the good in your life, being grateful. Have, have you ever felt unappreciated? Have you, have you ever felt that you were not being thanked, not being remembered for the good things that you do? 
oddly enough, at least according to the scientists who have done some study here, compliments and words of thanks from other people don't always help. They don't necessarily make you happy. And if you are someone who struggles with happiness, perhaps your friends have tried to say good things to you and to thank you and to cheer you up. And, and maybe they've discovered that that doesn't always help. The only thing that helps is what is at the center of our souls, at the center of our spirits. And if there is gratitude there, if there's any thankfulness there, that's what can make us happy. An experiment was done by some scientists. They asked volunteers, one by one, to write a letter as if they were sending it to a person who had really meant something good in their lives. Someone who really meant something positive to them. Write this letter and thank them for what they mean to you. And so then each volunteer wrote the letter of thanks to that person that they were so glad to have or have had in their lives. And then they were surprised when, when the researcher said, okay, here's a telephone, call that person up right now and read that letter to them. And you can imagine the kind of experience that came out of that. There were tears of happiness and tears of friendship in those conversations that happened on the telephone. And yes, there was one volunteer in the experiment who had written a letter to someone who had already died. So he was asked to read his letter out loud as if that person could hear it. And when this experiment was over, the people were asked to compare how happy they had been before they came into the room and how happy they were now. And every single person reported that they were happier now because they had thought of someone for whom they were grateful, someone that they could give thanks for. And the person who had been the least happy at the beginning according to their own report, reported the greatest change in happiness at the end of the experiment. Now remember, remember the words of Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now there is more than one way to be poor and more than one way to suffer and struggle. And if we find ourselves spiritually poor, the only way out is into the arms of God to examine our lives, to see if there's anything, anything that we can give thanks for. The Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians in the fourth chapter, he said, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. No matter how discouraged we might be, and certainly in the story that Jesus tells, the poor man, Lazarus, as far as we know, had nothing to be happy about. No matter how discouraged you might be, if you can discover any gratitude in yourself, Give yourself to that. Jesus gave up everything for us. 
So, being grateful, being thankful. Apparently that is what makes us happy. At least that is where we begin. Not, something th not someone thanking us, not someone calling us the citizen of the year, but us thanking someone. Is it possible that Lazarus was thankful at all? Is it possible that the thief on the cross had some thankfulness in him?